it is the cocktail stick, the key to glamour, elegance and stylish entertaining. And so we come to this, <coughs> I'm afraid, far from inexpensive dish which I have here as a centrepiece. This is called an assiette des fruits de mer, a dish of the fruits of the sea. Seafoods which make a most lovely presentation dish on a buffet when you're going a bit grand. A good cook was an artist as well as a craftsman, and people spent an incredible amount of time making things look fancy. Jenny, how on earth did you manage to do all this when you were working? Well, it was pretty hard work, but I used to do a lot of preparation in advance. Uh, so what I'd do, for example, with the grapefruit, that would be done the night before and put in the refrigerator. We would have drinks, drinky poos, and of course some canapé or appetizers, as they're called now. Mm -hmm. And we'd start off probably with something like this. So this would be all before we moved through? Oh, yes, indeed. I would have done this the night before. And what are these? Now, these are pieces of fried bread with cream cheese on top and a little bit of tomato. Mm. And this is better than the Ritz cracker? Oh, much. <laughs> one bite or two? Well, one bite if you wish. Mm. But I think it's easier with two. One's more dainty. Mm. <laughs> Well, certainly in the in the fifties, there was a hangover really from before the war, and, and you didn't sort of talk about food. It was considered very impolite. I suppose this was because one's parents and grandparents had been Edwardians, Victorians, and it was just not done to talk about food. And you certainly couldn't say at a dinner party, "Goodness, that was delicious! Can I have the recipe?" And now, if somebody doesn't, you you want to kill them, don't you? If they just munch in silence. But in those days, one munched in silence. But you needed silence and concentration to appreciate the attention to detail. The important quality in a cocktail foodstuff is that it should be both tiny and dainty. A slice of stuffed olive, a tiny newborn gherkin, or a silver skin onion would all be suitable. A dill cucumber or pickled egg would be quite, quite wrong. Beverly, where are the olives? In the kitchen, Lawrence. Lawrence, if you want olives, would you put them out, please? Oh, no. They're early, aren't they? No, they're not. And you're not changed. Yes, I know that. I would serve something like this. Uh, the silver onions there. Mm -hmm. And stuffed olives, or they could be plain olives. Gherkin and cheese. And why did you always choose these four things? Well, they're a little bit salty. And, of course, they're easy to buy. And, of course, <laughs> it didn't mean that everybody would eat the food. Yeah. <laughs> they were hungry. Mm. Of course, as long as they didn't eat too many. Well, that's, that's it. But, uh, of course, if I was well planned, they'd jolly well not have the chance. Mm. And, of course, with the oh. cheese, we could put pineapple on it. Oh, that yes. Was very nice and, and would you sometimes put an orange or a grapefruit? With the well, not for a dinner sauce. party. That's not quite with it. Uh, for a din If you were having a party party, that's fine. But, mm. no. Oh, I see. Like so that was not very high class. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> If we're going to have scalloped haddock, we want scallop shells. Here is one. And while I say a word to you about scallop shells, I'll pipe the Duchess potato round. Um, Fanny Craddock was the great television cook, and she was still working on rather grand, Frenchified sort of food. And I do remember her once colouring her mashed potato pale green and then piping it rather vigorously all over the scallop shells. And uh, as I say, that, that's gone down into family history. I don't think you can beat that for, for sort of unnecessary food. Why lemon baskets? Aren't they a bit fussy and idly? Well, you see, supposing you've got clean hands and you carefully manicured them and you're having a meal, you don't want to get them covered with little messy bits of lemon. These look pretty. And then, you see, you can take them and you can squeeze your juice over your portion and put it back again. It still looks pleasant and your hands are unmarked. When was the Follophon at its prime, would you say? Well, I think in the mid-60s. It was the last gasp of rather smart party food. And up till then, we'd had things like sherry parties, which always had just a dry biscuit or a cheese straw. And people suddenly got frightfully ambitious and had mixed drinks and sort of semi-buffet food. The age of baby sham brought huge enthusiasm for the cocktail cherry, which found its way out of our glasses and onto our melons, grapefruits and puddings as garnish. There was an awful occasion once, I remember, in a rather dark kitchen, and I reached for the jar, which I thought were maraschino cherries, and fished them out with a teaspoon and threw them onto the, I can't remember what the pudding was, something creamy, 
and that it wasn't until I saw my guests' faces I, I realised that I'd actually garnished them with pink cocktail onions, just quite in the spirit of a sweet pudding, <laughs> as you can imagine. The important thing was that you made people welcome, uh, they knew you were making an effort, you were showing off how good you were, of course, and being a little bit upmarket, and they would then dress accordingly and behave accordingly. So it really became an event. There was no slackness about anything that we did. It was part and parcel of the, the era and the attitude. <laughs> but I was terribly shocked, really, the first time I had a guest arrive in a jumper. I couldn't believe it. And I suppose that was the turning point when the casual attitude was coming in. It didn't stop me preparing things properly, but on the other hand, it rather sort of changed. Sadly, the lovely trend for showing off with little bits of garnish and cocktail sticks is being usurped by a horrid new trend for plain old-fashioned cooking with no garnish whatsoever. Frankly, I'll have none of it. It's lovely showing off, and in my view, no shepherd's pie is complete without a little bit of sliced olive and a cocktail cherry.